Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm going to take today's video to talk about one of the oldest and perhaps the most insidious American conspiracy theory. And this is the conspiracy theory that the monuments left behind by Native Americans, commonly what's referred to as the mound builders, we'll dissect that and dig a little bit deeper into that here in a second, that these monuments were not the products of the Native Americans themselves, but were rather the products of giants or some other long lost civilization or some other European civilization or some other group of Jewish people, um, some group of people other than the Native Americans themselves. So what we're gonna do is briefly overview the conspiracy itself, talk about some of the common forms that this argument takes and some of the primary issues with it, as well as learn hopefully a little bit about the uh, quote unquote mound builders themselves and realize the history itself is a lot more fascinating and a lot more complicated than how the conspiracy theory presents it. Let's jump straight into it. Like all conspiracy theories, this one seeks to explain a particular phenomenon. What this narrative is attempting to do is to explain some particular fact. In this case, the archaeological and the historical evidence that we have of the existence of these sites, of these very large earthenwork pyramids and what appears to be massive cities. Evidence of this advanced civilization which existed in North America prior to the arrival of Europeans. Now, the established narrative here, the official narrative here, is that these cities, these structures, these earthenwork pyramids, that they were built by the Native Americans who inhabited the area, but the conspiracy theory wants to say that that's wrong. Like most conspiracies, this comes in a wide variety of different shapes and forms. One of the oldest iterations that we have, uh, by oldest, I mean this this is a very common narrative that starts to appear um, throughout the 1800s, even as we'll see by some very prominent uh, political figures and within America at the time. Um, this comes in the form that these structures or that these cities were built by giants. Now, that sounds a little strange, and it is, but uh, this kind of builds off of some other, this has its roots in some interpretations of the Bible, particularly uh, book six of Genesis, where we get the flood narrative right before the flood narrative. There's talk of the Nephilim, and it, a, a common interpretation at the time is that the Nephilim were giants, the byproduct of the inner breeding and inner mixing of angels in human women, that these created these monstrosities, giant people. There's a lot of theology there, and there's a lot of history there, history of the church and history of biblical interpretation to unpack. We're just going to skip over a lot of it. But the belief that was prevalent at the time, and as we'll see, still prevalent in some circles today, was that the offspring of these angels and humans produced these giants. Um, this is, by the way, this takes place within the context of book six of Genesis, which is the, the flood narrative of Noah. And this is part of the reason why God has to destroy the earth is because all of these wicked people that were inhabiting it, these, these Nephilim, the men of old, the men of renown. And the conspiracy states that these giants, these Nephilim, weren't totally killed off by the flood, that they continue to exist, and that their existence can explain certain features of history, specifically, um, in this case, the who built these massive giant structures. Uh, but this also comes in the forms of uh, aliens, as the History Channel show Ancient Aliens has purported, and uh, most recently, and perhaps most popularly, by pseudo-archaeologists such as Graham Hancock in his most recent Netflix show, Ancient Apocalypse, argues that these structures and these early Native American cities were influenced by some uh, former previously lost civilization which existed in the Americas. Sometimes this is identified with cities such as the lost city of Atlantis, that this is an Atlantean civilization. And the conspiratorial part is that this is all being covered up by mainline archaeologists and historians, that there's a concerted effort by both groups to keep this truth hidden. On its own, this view is what we would identify as pseudo-archaeology. It's pseudo-archaeology because it's arguing against 
the standard interpretation of the evidence of proposing this alternative theory. Where the conspiratorial part comes in is when people like Hancock and when other people that are more religiously affiliated will argue there was a very popular idea going around about 10 years ago that there was evidence of uh, skeletons of giants that was found at these Native American sites and that they were collected by the Smithsonian and destroyed. The idea here is that there is a there is a true hidden history that's being kept from the general public and that we're actively being lied to, we're actively being misled, or that archaeologists or historians are trying to actively suppress this truth. And that's where the conspiratorial part comes in. As we'll see, there's a lot wrong with this argument, but one of the big fallacies that it commits, I think, I've been trying to pinpoint this for a while, but I believe that it commits a form or a version of the argument for ignorance or the absence of evidence fallacy. Another thing that it does is it, it kind of rearranges how historical methodology ought to operate by proceeding from theory rather than evidence. But We'll unpack that a little bit more later. I want to point you to a recent example of this conspiracy theory that I found. It's from the network Gaia. Uh, they also have a YouTube channel. They have 1.5 million subscribers. That's insane. Um, this video came up on my feed because I, I circle through and cycle through a lot of uh, conspiracy videos in order to have content for my whole channel here. Uh, and this video caught my attention. And it's something that I've heard quite a bit. It's from a year ago, and there's a gentleman here that's talking about uh, a book or a, I think it's a documentary that he has recently written. Um, and he's going to kind of rehash some of these old ideas. But as we see, these 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 ideas have been circulating almost as long as Europeans have arrived in the United States and what is now North America. So let's jump straight into it. They were and like this taking is, a bottle cap off a of beer. But, but Native American, Native Amer First Nation people tell us exactly the same thing. Same Thousands thing. of years later, these red-haired, six-fingered giants would come in, rip the heads off to the graves, drink the blood, you know, mutilate the bodies. I mean, crazy stuff. And this is all... In, in Native American oral tradition. I'm not making that, this that stuff is, up. You can't make this no, stuff up. No, you can't. Up. In St. Louis, where I come from a lot. Cahokia. Right across the river in Cahokia, Cahokia Illinois. The Cahokia Mounds. What the heck are these mounds? They're all over the planet. Yeah. Cahokia is about 450,000 uh, tons of earth. So what does that mean? If you, were to stay, if you were to deconstruct the mound and put all that dirt in dump trucks, all right, you get end-to-end -end dump trucks over 200 miles long. Wow. That gives us an idea of the amount of dirt. Full to the top. Full to the top. Yeah, in your film on the trail of the Nephilim, you take a look at what the mounds look like. See that from above. That's amazing, isn't it? It is. Mind-blowing. Well, are they burial grounds, L.A.? No, they're not. They're, they're not. not. They're not burial grounds. Although they have been used uh, for, for Native Americans coming in and will use them for, for secondary interments. But the original... The, the original, let's say, Cahokia, because you mentioned that, um, on top of Cahokia was a platform. And allegedly, on top of the platform, archaeologists believe there was a, a construction about um, 50 feet by 100 feet and allegedly 40 feet high. There was a stockade all oh. around Cahokia, 10 feet high. Why do they need that? What, right. what, what are they doing? And in my opinion, Cahokia, Miamisburg, other sites that we've been to, these are gateways. These are portals. These are high places. And in fact, I could. All right. So there is a lot to unpack here. But um, as you can hopefully hear, maybe not hopefully hear, as you can glean from the video, the general argument here is that sites like Cahokia, which we'll delve into a little bit here in a second, that these sites are evidence of this race of giants that once existed. And these giants, of course, are responsible for sites like Cahokia and the building and the construction of these massive structures. Now, this video centers around the fact that these giants are Nephilim, um, the, the byproducts of the interbreeding of humans and angels, and that this, this race of giants once existed, and that the existence of these giants have been kept a secret by, the, by people like the U.S. government. But as I suggested before, these arguments aren't new. They've been around 
in one version or another for quite some time. Two prominent examples here. We have uh, one from Andrew Jackson and the other from Abraham Lincoln. This quote from Andrew Jackson comes from a second annual message that he delivered in 1830. And this is important, as we'll see later, because it provides the context and the justification for actions that Jackson would take later on in his presidency, um, specifically the revoking of the lands of the Native Americans, the forced removal of Native Americans from their homeland, and the war on the Native Americans that happened throughout the 19th century. Um, so this message specifically is kind of the justification for the Native American Removal Act that's later passed by Jackson. This is what Jackson says. In the monuments and fortresses of an unknown people spread over the extension, extensive regions of the West, we behold the memorials of a once powerful race, which was exterminated or has disappeared to make room for the existing savage tribes. Nor is there anything in this which, upon a comprehensive view of the general interest of the human race, is to be regretted. Philanthropy could not wish to see the continent restored to the condition which it was found by our forefathers. What good man would prefer a country covered with forest and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic, studded with cities, towns, farms, massive population size, and filled with all the blessings of liberty, civilization, and religion. Jackson is here channeling an idea that will be present in European encounters with Native Americans since the very first encounters recorded by Columbus back in the 15th century. Columbus's encounter, when he encounters the Arwaks in the, in the Caribbean, will describe them as a docile um, He'll comment on their lack of intelligence, their lack of organization, and their ability to be easily manipulated by Columbus and crew, their willingness to kind of give whatever they have. This is a very common colonial narrative that we'll hear, not just with the Spanish, but also with the French and the English encounter with Native Americans. The portrayal of Native Americans, a common trope during the time of the Enlightenment, is that of the noble savage. There are certain virtues that Europeans and Americans will see in natives, such as their uh, perhaps their physical beauty, their appreciation for nature, their connection with the environment. But it's almost a, but at the same time, it's an appreciation rooted in pity. And it's appreciation rooted in this fact, you can kind of see the inherent value judgment here that the Europeans, I mean, this is denoted within the term savage itself, that the Europeans are the ones that are bringing and promoting civilization, that it's the Europeans that are the ones that are living in these massive cities, that it's the Europeans are the ones that have this advanced technology that they're bringing to this people who are on the whole portrayed as like living out in the woods, living in small groups, they're unorganized, they don't have clothes, they don't have technology. And it's this sort of dichotomy that's presented between the quote unquote civilized West and the Native Americans. But there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance that's also happening that as these Europeans start to discover more and more of the new world, what they are finding is evidence of these once massive cities and massive structures which once existed in North America. Now, in the case of Central and South America, or especially in the case of Mesoamerica, these won't be archaeological ruins they're discovering, but they themselves will see uh, so in the form of the Aztec and the Inca Empire, these massive, extraordinarily wealthy empires. But part of the reason for this characterization is that by the time we get the Louisiana Purchase in the 19th century, by the time we get the spread of, in this case, what would be the United States to West, the tribes that are there are going to be heavily ravaged by disease, by colonialism, and then by the 19th century in the United States, by active genocide that's being carried out. So, so the conflict, the, the dissonance that they're encountering is that they're trying to reconcile the fact that 
the Native Americans that they're encountering don't appear to be capable, at least from their perspective, of having done all of these great things. Now, again, this is inherently rooted in a deep-seated ignorance, and in this case, explicit racism, towards these people that was used to justify their action. But as a result, to explain what they're finding, there's going to be this popular influx of ideas and arguments that are presented to explain all of these wonderful sites. And the common argument that's presented is that these sites were built not by the Native Americans themselves, of course, but by these giants or by this lost civilization. And going back to that dichotomy between the quote-unquote savage and quote-unquote civilization, you see that presented here in Jackson's work. And what he's referring to throughout this speech are, are causes which sought to help out and to assist the Native Americans to perhaps give them back his land. And Jackson's making an active argument against that by saying that we don't want to replace what the quote unquote West has. The implication here is that the current Native American tribes that Jackson was actively seeking to exterminate, that these people were incapable of producing these prior monuments and that it was those people that had wiped out this previous civilization or this previous group of people. And this is gonna serve as the basis for what Jackson himself is going to do and to carry out on the Native Americans. We see this expressed in a little bit more of a benign form a little bit later on by Abraham Lincoln, but I put this quote here to show you um, how influential and how widespread this idea is. So this is um, so this quote takes place 18 years later, and Lincoln writes this kind of in his notebook, his diary on his visit to Niagara Falls. After having viewed the falls, this is what he records in his journal. It, it calls up the indefinite past when Columbus first sought this continent, when Christ suffered on the cross, when Moses led Israel through the Red Sea, nay, even when Adam first came from the hand of his maker, then as now Niagara was roaring here. The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones still fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours does now. So there is this popular idea, and you can see this uh, as published in newspapers, even newspapers like the New York Times of these skeletons of these giants that were being found at these Native American mounds, uh, most of which were largely proved to be later on to be hoaxes or planted there by the people who made the quote-unquote discoveries. But this idea that the giants are buried at the mounds and that the giants are responsible for the construction of the mounds, um, I just include this quote here by Lincoln to show you how widespread and how popular these ideas were, even as far back as the 19th century. So this leads us to the historical question of exactly who were these mound builders. Now, the term mound builders is a, a rather unhelpful term because it refers to a collection of groups of people, tribes of people, and entire civilizations that were all just that we're just kind of throwing into this general grouping that covers a 5,000 year period of American history. Um, this period, but what unites these people under the mound builder umbrella is its namesake, is the mounds and the structures that they constructed. These earthen work platforms, pyramids, cones that they made, which we believe serve some sort of religious purpose. This time span ranges, we have some, we're literally talking about hundreds of different sites spread across thousands of miles, which incorporates numerous different civilizations, languages, religious systems that we're kind of lumping under this general umbrella, dating all the way back. Some of the first examples of mounds that we have date back to Watson Break in 3500 BCE extending all the way to the most recent mounds that were constructed in the 18th century, just at the arrival of Europeans is actually when they stopped doing these because of the spread of Europeans into North America. Uh, the namesake is this cultural trait of mound builders was the building of mounds and other earthen works. 
Um, as we'll see, there's different types of mounds that they're constructing. Um, there's walls that they're building, raised platforms that they're building um, that centered on and around religious sites as well as cities, uh, in some cases, massive cities. As I alluded to, this refers to cultures and civilizations that spanned over a vast geographical range but largely centered on the, if you're familiar with American geography, the Mississippi River and all of its tributaries, expanding all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, modern day states like Louisiana, all the way up into the Great Lakes, modern day Canada, Wisconsin, Michigan, those areas if, as far east as the Appalachian Mountains and the kind of the lowlands the coast of Georgia, South Carolina, even, and as far west in parts of modern-day Texas. So a vast array that spread over a 5,000-year period. At its height, this would be exemplified in what's referred to as the Mississippian period. The Mississippian period would last roughly from 800 CE to 1600 CE. And the Mississippian period is important because it's this time of economic flourishing. And it's the time when sites like Cahokia, which is the largest of these sites, was built and constructed. But not all of this takes place within the context of what we would consider to be civilization. Um, we have evidence in North America of various hunting and gathering tribes that also built some of these early built some of these early structures and early proto calendars that we see in these sites. So let's talk a little bit about Cahokia because it was explicitly referenced in the video. Cahokia represents the largest of these sites and the most complex of these sites. Cahokia is located in modern-day St. Louis in Missouri. The dating of the site is a little complicated because Cahokia at its peak in the 11th century will be the home of a massive city, but there's archaeological evidence that suggests that the site was inhabited as early as 1200 BCE, inhabited before that or frequented before that by various hunters and gathering groups, uh, but around 1200 BCE is when we start to see uh, permanent or semi-permanent settlements that are start to be established there. But it's not till 600 CE that we get permanent residents inhabiting the site of Cahokia. The civilization will reach its peak around approximately 1100 CE. And at its peak, the city would incorporate about six square miles and would include over 120 different earthworks various mounds of different sizes and shapes that were used for different purposes. Estimates about the population of the city range at its peak, this is taken from an archaeological survey, a geographical survey that was done of the area, which says that between AD 1050 and 1100, Cahokia's population was anywhere from between 1,400 to 2,800 people, but that at its peak, we're looking at anywhere between 10,000 to 15,000 people. And this is just within the city center itself. That's that six square mile radius. Cahokia also included and incorporate what we would call suburbs, so you could think of Cahokia as the downtown area, and there are all these various suburbs, these little villages and farming areas that are located within pretty close proximity of Cahokia. And that brings up the number of estimated people living in this region. The estimates range from 20 to 40,000 people at around the 11th century CE which would make Cahokia one of the largest cities in the world, on par easily with Paris or France at the time. So you're talking about a massive city structure, home of roughly, in the downtown area, home to roughly 15,000 people. 
in one of the most complex cities in North America, and actually Monk's Mound, which is the tallest of the mounds at Cahokia, will be the largest structure that's built in North America until the late 19th century. And just to give you a sense of scale, by the time that the Civil War happens in 1860, the largest city in the American South, for example, is going to be the cities of Charleston and Savannah, which had less than 50,000 people. So cities like Cahokia won't be rivaled in the United States until the late 19th century. And then you're still talking about cities like New York City, which was one of the largest cities in the world at the time. So you're talking about a massive city complex. And anytime you're talking about a city this size, you're talking about an extremely sophisticated economy because you have to keep in mind there's a lot that's needed to support a city like this. And by a lot, I mean there was a massive agricultural infrastructure surrounding the city based primarily on maize and squash, corn and squash production. But you're talking about thousands of acres of farmland that would be needed to support a city of this size. An extensive trade network Again, we're talking about at its peak in the 11th century, we have evidence of shells that were taken. Let me bring up my map here. Shells that were found that originated from the Gulf of Mexico. On this map, Cahokia is roughly here. Shells from the Gulf of Mexico, flint and other stones from the Appalachian Mountains, copper that originated from the Great Lakes, so you're talking about a city and a civilization that exerted a wide range trade influence and that would later influence other sites and the styles and the types of mounds that they built. And in addition to the ex extraordinarily complicated economic system that undoubtedly existed to support this was also a very extensive religious system and structure. Most of these mounds we believe, again, supported some sort of religious ceremony, religious purpose. We know that at sites like Cahokia and at other sites that were influenced by Cahokia, that you had these calendars that were made that we believe kept track of things like the summer and the winter solstice. In fact, Monk's Mound, which is the largest mound found at Cahokia, during the summer solstice, the sun will rise over Monk's Mound, so it looks like the sun's coming from the mound. There was a structure which was built on top of the mound, which we believe was a place where the king or the chieftain would live, uh, or very the perhaps the royal family. And there were some connections in Cahokia, as well as in other Mississippi River Valley civilizations, cultures, which suggest a linkage between the king and the son. In addition to the household of the royal family, we also have on top of these mounds um, extensive courts that were used to play various games. We have evidence through the, the trash that we have found that there were very elaborate and extensive ceremonies that took place. These religious festivals undoubtedly drew massive amount of people from the debris that we found left over from these festivals. You're talking tens of thousands of people. The, the court for the ball game that was played would be able to house about 10,000 people that would stand around and watch this game. We believe that they may have placed bets and performed other sports games and venues at this area. The mounds themselves are earthen mounds constructed with a combination of clay and sand. Um, this is a artistic rendering of maybe how that process would work, including clay in the middle, a layer of sand, another layer of clay, sand. This was to help prevent erosion and to establish the existence of the mounds over time. This is an artistic rendering of what the city may have looked like at its peak. This included a combination of religious or ceremonial structures and the forms of the mounds that would have been scattered throughout the city, temple mounds, as well as mounds for the playing of the ball game and the calendar, different types of mounds, which are found at Cahokia, three different types, platform mounds. These are very flat top mounds 
a platform mound, for example, um, is the type of mound that you see for the ball court. Conical mounds, these are more rounded mounds. It's the conical mounds that also serve as burial sites. We found extensive burials within these mounds, even at places like Cahokia. At Cahokia, we found what we believe to be the burial of royalty. There was a, a gentleman there that's found in his grave who had this emblem of this, it's either this hawk or eagle that was made out of all of these fancy beads, along with an extensive amount of wealth and as well as servants, we believe maybe servants, slaves that were buried along with him. And examples of this are not limited to Cahokia, but extend throughout all of the mound building sites. Ridge top mounds, which are actually unique to Cahokia, that have a unique shape. So instead of the platform mounds, they're like a, an elevated platform, usually to build the houses of nobles on. So we actually know a fair amount about Cahokia and as well as the other mound building civilizations. The issue arises is that the mound builders or the Mississippian culture, part of the issue that arises is that the mound builders didn't have a formal writing system. And as a result, all that they left behind was their physical stuff, the places that they lived, the places that they worshiped. And we can glean a lot from the archeological evidence, but there's also a lot that is based off of educated guessing or speculation in some cases. And this is where the conspiracy theory starts to creep in because we don't have a written record. We don't have a detailed breakdown of exactly how and when they built these places. You combine that with the sort of racial biases that are present in early colonial Americas that these people could not have made these. And then you get people inserting historical actors into places where they don't belong. So the biggest fallacy that I see being committed here is a misuse of the historical method itself. So typically what I mean by that is when you're dealing with a culture in a civilization that doesn't have a writing system, what you have to base everything you know about those people on is the stuff that they leave behind. And how this works with archaeology with archaeologists as well as historians is a collection of this wide, vast array of different types of evidence. And there was a tremendous, to be clear, there was a tremendous amount of stuff that is left behind in the form of not just of the earthen mounds themselves, but also in the form of the pottery that was left behind the clothing, the jewelry, necklaces, braces, the sculptures. Cahokia is also one of the few places that we see metalworking, especially in the Mississippian cultures. And from all of that data and from all of that evidence, you take all of it together and then you very carefully and delic delicately begin to put together a narrative about when these cultures developed. And then once you have all of that evidence together, you can start to maybe fill in some of the gaps about more tentative and speculative aspects about what they were doing, specifically about their like religious beliefs and stuff like that. Because again, it's like walking into a church and trying to figure out the nature and origin of Christianity just by looking at the cross that was left behind. It's only going to be able to provide you so much information. But what we see here with the conspiracy theories is sort of the opposite. It's a positing of a narrative and then later a trying to finding evidence that fits that narrative. And the principal issue with that is it's kind of working in reverse order. Typically speaking, you want to gather and collect your evidence first, and then from that evidence, build a narrative. What we see happening here is the opposite. It's the construction of a narrative in spite of or in lieu of the evidence, which raises another critical point that I point out in my logic of conspiracy theory videos. That's an unclear standard of evidence that's being utilized by these theories. With most historical theories and narratives, they contain within the narrative itself a clear 
demarcator which would show you whether that whether or not that narrative corresponds to the evidence. So if, for example, I was to make the claim that the Mississippian culture disappeared as a result of catastrophic warfare between the Mississippian culture and other, let's say, Western coast civilizations, which existed in North America at the time, I would have to back up that narrative with archaeological evidence. Is there evidence of conflict? Do we see cities that are being burnt down? Do we see a massive amount of arrowheads in one spot indicating a battle? There's ways to confirm or deny that theory. In this case, the conspiracy theories have an unclear standard of evidence because what sort of evidence would be needed to support these claims? Well, if you're going to argue that giants built these structures, then where are the skeletal remains of those giants? Ah, but the conspiracy theory says they've all been destroyed by the Smithsonian, for example. So there's no way to validate, or in this case, to invalidate those theories. Or in the case of Hancock, that there's some long lost civilization that's responsible, that influenced and helped and assisted the mound builders where is the evidence of that civilization? Because we do have a ton of physical evidence of pottery, baskets, jewelry, clothing, the physical sites that we left behind. And while we don't have a complete picture of what civilizations like this look like, we can start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But what we don't have is evidence of some other pre-existing civilization. What would be needed in order to confirm that theory is concrete evidence. Now, before I end the video, I want to leave you with some resources. If you're interested in learning more about Native American civilization, or if you're, interest, if you're interested in archaeology of North America specifically, I would like to point you to my friend Dr. Bill Farley's channel, Archaeology Tube. I've interviewed Bill Farley on my own channel, you can find that interview here. I will link it in the description of this video as well as Dr. Farley's channel. He has a channel called Archaeology Tube. Um, it's a very interesting channel because he also delves into archaeo gaming and he talks a lot about the relationship between history and video games. Dr. Farley has also done a detailed breakdown of the claims made in Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse. And he has some fantastic resources about archaeology and the history of the early Americas. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for everything that Dr. Farley has to say. So please go check out his channel if you're interested in learning more about this. Well, thank you for joining me today, and I will see you all later.